Welcome to Caravan, the art of wayfaring podcast that tells the stories of people and places in Turkey. When was the last time you were somewhere that Google Maps or any other GPS service just got totally wrong? Cell phones with enough data to load reliable maps and coordinates have begun to feel almost as necessary as life jackets while whitewater rafting. But it wasn't that long ago that people who traveled somewhere they had never been before had to hunt down and purchase the latest and most reliable map. And it wasn't long before that that even vague maps didn't exist for many places in the world. Rewind about 400 years from today. The globe hasn't been totally explored, and actually not by a long shot. Even if we had a map of the world, the geopolitical borders would look totally different. Back then, every square inch of the world hadn't yet been divided up into nation states. And for the most part, the ethnic groups of the world lived in larger empires or colonies of empires, much like coins in just a few bowls. Depending on where you lived, your people may even have only very little contact with the quote-unquote empire or the national authorities that stood above your local authorities. Outside of soldiers, pilgrims, and international merchants, very few people had the opportunity or the resources to travel. The peoples that lived in your general vicinity were the only ones you had contact with. Now imagine setting out across a continent in that environment. In fact, make that three continents. No Nat Geo to prepare you for exotic animals, no Wikipedia to quickly cross-reference the story of a famous person or a place, and sometimes no map even to show you where you are. It was that vast horizon of unknown that dominated the travel culture of the world around the time of Evlia Celebi. Most people in the West have never heard the name Celebi before, but if you mention travel and exploration in Turkey, it would be the first name on most people's lips. And I would say that if Art of Wayfaring has to have any Ottoman patron saint, it would certainly be this man. Celebi was born in Istanbul in 1611. From what we can piece together from hints in his own writing, it seems that his dad was a Sufi mystic, which if you don't know what that is, just imagine something like a whirling dervish. And if you don't know what that is, I can't help you. His mom, on the other hand, had been a servant owned in the court of Ahmed I, the sultan. She served governors and politicians and observed the nobility from the inside. This unique mix of religion on one hand and cosmopolitan wisdom on his other hand left an indelible mark on the young Ottoman due to his parents. In addition to their influence, Celebi enjoyed a youth spent in and around the Sultan's palace. He was educated first in a madrasa, or a Quranic school, where he stood out from other children with his ability to recite the Quran. It wasn't long before he began his education in the Ottoman court, where he shined once again. As a boy, he quickly learned calligraphy, music, storytelling, performing even for the Sultan himself. The first two decades of his life passed, and it seemed that he would grow into a successful, albeit rather ordinary man. His parents had designs on him, rising in status in the court and continuing as a religious authority and having a beautiful little family. But a dream one night, on the eve of Celebi's 20th birthday, would put an end to all that. As Celebi lay on his bed, he dreamt that a man in a worn yellow shawl and yellow boots approached him. The figure was wearing a 12-band turban with a toothpick stuck in it. Then, in the way one only can in a dream, he realized it was Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. Muhammad announced the plan of God to the awestruck young man. He reported that God wanted Chalebi to do something special, which was to leave behind the imperial court and become a world traveler that would, quote, compose a marvelous work based on his travels. Now, there's no way for us to tell if Chalebi made the story up in order to justify a pre-existing wanderlust, or if he really did have the dream as he presents it. Regardless, the 20th year of his life was to be a pivotal time. Traveling in the 17th century was expensive and difficult. Without a Eurorail or airlines donated by generous elderly relatives, the aspiring wayfarer needed to find a way to finance justify, and even administrate his expeditions. But he was talented and resourceful. The majority of his impressive travel itinerary in the coming decades would actually be paid for by the state itself as Chalebi sought out official duties that would take him abroad. 
The first time he put pen to page was in his 20s, shortly after his dream. He began honing his skill in his hometown of Istanbul. He would walk around and describe the architecture and the people of the city that he loved so well and knew from the inside. These early writings would be the first of 10 volumes covering hundreds of pages in a massive tome that he would produce. He started around 1640 and continued until his death 40 years later. Becoming an author and a traveler was more than just a career move. It was even a shift in identity. It was at this time that he gave himself the pen name Evliya, which he adopted in honor of his teacher and his mentor, Evliya Mehmet Effendi. But how to get further abroad? That was the question. Chelebi lived at the very end of the peak of the Golden Age in the Ottoman Empire. Not long before him, the much-loved sultan, Solomon the Great, lived. These were the decades before the wealth and the internal strife of the sprawling empire began to erode its strength from the inside, thus leaving it vulnerable to revolution of independence and attacks from foreign armies. This was the perfect time for a young man to wander through the country. Much of his early career happened under the notorious Murat IV, a ruler known for his temper, his harshness, and his exaggerated enforcement of certain religious laws. Yet Chelebi, who had already established his excellent character and his religious zeal, found favor in the sovereign's eyes. He would be allowed to travel as a diplomat and a chaplain as long as he came back to tell the court the stories of his travels. He thought, what could be better? Time would fail us to dip too deeply into the details of any of Chelebi's journeys. But for the next 40 years, he would find various roles to play in expeditions both within the Ottoman Empire and into Europe. He records many of his responsibilities in his writings, which were diverse. Sometimes it was up to him to ransom Ottoman prisoners who had fallen into captivity during battle. Other times he was in charge of procuring supplies for warring armies. He was known to be a tax collector in distant provinces that had been holding out on the sultan, and he distributed war booty after military campaigns. He fought directly as a soldier too. He didn't just stay on the sidelines as an observer. He went to war in Anatolia, Lebanon, Croatia, and Crete. Sometimes he acted as a part of an ambassadorial staff, and other times he was the lead negotiator in conflicts with vassal states and their leaders. Once he even worked as a muezzin, who is the person who does the call to prayer, in the court at Vienna. Ironically, considering he's essentially the Marco Polo of the Middle East, Celebi was not a great traveler. A certain percentage of his work is just records of him complaining about traveling. He was afraid of journeys by sea, wary of boats. He was a fussy eater and was stricken with traveler's gut on numerous occasions. On top of all that, he didn't travel very light. In all his travels, he never records taking less than six slaves along, often more. And despite the heaviness and the expense of doing so, he insisted on bringing his personal library and most of his wardrobe with him. Not exactly a gap year backpacker. Knowing what we do about the religious and political environment that his patrons had created in the empire and his own devout Islamic faith, it would be easy to assume that Chalebi was also a pious writer. But despite boasting that he recited the Quran over a thousand times in his life, our traveler created more of a nuanced character for himself in his books. There was no question that he took Islam very seriously, even to the point of looking down on European Christians and other minorities in the Ottoman Empire. But he could also be surprisingly playful and even a little controversial. He wrote about aged imams, still able to complete the, quote, greater jihad, which was a tongue-in-cheek reference to sex. He joked about not being able to find bathrooms before disaster struck in foreign cities and what kind of picture it must have painted that time he was in the middle of a sword fight and he soiled his pants. To spice up the narrative, he also throws in fantasy amidst the fact. In one place, he tells the story of a woman who, to everyone's surprise, gives birth to a baby elephant. He reports that once, when he was in the Far East, he met a pack of hungry cannibals who also turned out to be Buddhist monks. There were stories of giant birds and yellow trees with leaves that would heal all your diseases. See, Chalebi's priority wasn't that of a strict historian or a serious anthropologist. He took to the road to do something great and to have a grand adventure. Then he employed his storytelling to invite his readers and his listeners to join him on the road. 
Just think about it. We know that some of the best stories to listen to resemble truth but are actually made up. If that weren't the case, we would have classrooms in place of movie theaters. The character he created for himself is a type of wise fool that quotes the Quran in one breath and tells off-color jokes with the next. On one line, he would record some basic words and phrases of a new language he learned, and on the next, he would translate all the dirtiest pickup lines and barroom insults he heard while speaking it. Near the end of his life, Chelebi settled down in Cairo. He had lived well, and he had fulfilled the dream he had years before. His life motto, shaped over many, many miles, had become Seahat Tijaret Ziaret, or in English, travel, trade, and pilgrimage. He had piles of manuscripts detailing his journeys, and with the help of some employees, he began to reshape them into what would simply be called the Seahat Name, or the Travelogue. The entire 10-volume work has never been totally translated into English, but you can read editions that contain excerpts from each volume under the title Evlia Celebi's Book of Travels. Inside, you'll find a first-person account from a quintessentially 17th century Ottoman intellectual's perspective. In his writings, Chelebi was open about his own flaws and some of the injustice that he witnessed that was perpetrated both by his Muslim Ottoman countrymen and the Europeans that he looked down on. The Book of Travels is mostly anecdotal, but it's also an indispensable insight into the Middle East and Europe 400 years ago. It's a synthesis, a marriage of fiction and nonfiction. It's inquisitive, it's forward-thinking for its time, it's gripping, and it's entertaining. Chelebi died before it was completed or ever published. Though he had orally recounted many of his stories, he missed the opportunity to see his work given to the world before he slipped away in 1684, most likely while still living in Cairo. The tenth and final volume of the work, which I have already mentioned was written in Cairo itself, mirrors the first volume about life in Istanbul. It was a fitting bookend to an extraordinary life lived on the road by the most accomplished Ottoman wayfarer, Evlia Celebi. Caravan is written, produced, and recorded by me, Sean Stevenson Douglas. Music was written and performed by our good friend Tarek Yilmaz. If you want to hear more about life and adventures in Turkey, find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit www.artofwayfaring.com. You'll find fresh content posted weekly on our website.